right, I think we're about to get started here. But uh, before we kick things off, I have a special file I'm going to play on my laptop real quick to kind of set the mood and tone for what we're going to talk about today. Oh, hello. Greetings, Reclaimers, and welcome to the Halo Anniversary Panel at Halo Fest 2011. Protocol requires that you take your seats so that the indexing may begin. All right, so. Uh, so first off, once again, I want to welcome everyone to the kickoff of Halo Fest at PAX Prime 2011. And for this first panel, we're going to be you know, talking about Halo Anniversary. You guys, uh, we announced it at E3 this year. Really excited to share that with everyone. Um, kind of kicking it off, uh, if you were at San Diego Comic Con or at home watching it on, on the internet, TV, whatever, you saw that we did a live demo of the silent cartographer in Halo Anniversary. So we thought we'd kind of kick things off uh, right at the beginning with a demo of a brand new space in Halo Anniversary that uh, you probably haven't seen before. So we're going to hand that off to Dennis and Dan Ayu. Hey everyone, thanks for coming. <clears throat> so, quick introductions. My name's Danny, but I'm executive producer at 343. Down here, moving along to demo, the lovely, the very talented Dennis Reese. Uh, Dennis is producer on Halo Anniversary, which is what we're here today to talk about. So, before we get started, we definitely got some really cool stuff we want to show you guys. A um, few things. Big question we get a lot is why are we doing this now? Well, November 15th is a very special day. Uh, not just for Halo fans, but for the industry in general, because November 15th, 10 years ago, Halo 1 launched and changed gaming forever, right? I mean, I'm sure everybody here remembers the first time you played Halo. It was an amazing experience, and I promised David I wouldn't swear today, so I'll try not to drop any F-bombs, just a quick warning. But no promises, Alice. It just might slip out. So um, it was a really freaking awesome experience, right? <laughs> so, I mean, everyone remembers the first time they played it, and we wanted to do something special around that 10-year anniversary. But the real reason we're doing it is, is the fans, right? It's people like you is the reason that this franchise is here 10 years later. I mean, it's just it's really incredible. So we wanted to do something special to commemorate that because this is something the fan base has been asking for for a really long time. Here's what we didn't want to do. Um, you know, I like to say it's the season of remakes right now, and what we didn't want to do is do an HD version, throw it in a box, and call it a day. We wanted to do something a little more special. We wanted to help capture that experience of what it was like to play this game for the first time, because, you know, again, everybody remembers the first time they played it. It was a very great, it was a very special experience. So we wanted to do some things to capture that and help reignite that experience of what it was like to play this game for the first time. So. What was really important for us was to exactly make sure the game played the same as it did 10 years ago. And one of the ways we did that is kind of a cool technical trick. We've actually layered portions of the original Halo code into the game. And on top of that, we layered a new graphics and audio engine. So what you get is really the best of both worlds. You've got a game that plays exactly as you remember, but it looks and sounds like a current generation title. So that's really, really cool. It was really important to us to make sure we got that. One of the other big things we've done that I'm personally most excited about with this game, probably heard a little bit about it, is Classic Mode. So for those of you who haven't heard about it, Classic Mode is a really cool feature. At any point in the game, you can hit the back button and the graphics flip back to how it looked 10 years ago. And you can come back and you can go back and forth as many times as you want. Really, really, really magical feature that uh, I don't do justice to just talking about it. So let's look at it. So we're going to load up. We're going to get going. Um, we're going to do something a little different than E3. E3, as, as David said, we showed Silent Cartographer. And we actually started in new mode and went to classic. Uh, we're going to have some fun today. We're actually going to start in classic mode. So we're going to start and you're going to see how this level looked uh, 10 years ago. While we're loading, quick word on multiplayer. Six multiplayer maps, one firefight. We have four of those multiplayer maps and the firefight map playable over at the Halo Fest area. Go check it out. So here it is. This is the 343 Guilty Spark 10 years ago. Whoa, lights, wrong way. Wrong way on the lights. I know I'm not an attractive guy, but we should get those lights down. So, all right, while we're waiting on the lights, we're just gonna get going. So the first thing people comment on when they get playing 
and they put their hands on the controllers as wow this plays exactly the same as it did 10 years ago it should we're running exactly the same code so the game plays behaves and reacts as it did so i promised you guys some fun with classic mode let's have some fun so this is it 10 years ago let's hit the back button how does it look today <laughs> so this is it this is what we got for you guys so what we get is a lot of cool things, especially on a level like this where people can, you know, had some issues, they got lost, things like that. We can use modern day level techniques to kind of light you and guide you on the path. What's cool about this classic mode, again, back and forth as many times as you want. You can be in combat, hit the back button, no stop. It just keeps right on going. So as Dennis starts fighting, we're going to pray he doesn't die in this demo and get really embarrassed. Uh, I'm just starting to hear some of the new audio. So we remastered the weapon effects, the sound effects. You know, I'm sure you guys remember the classic orchestral stuff that was very important to the field, the feel of this game. We worked with Skywalker Sound and their orchestra and we just redid all of that audio. So the game just sounds spectacular. We're obviously not really getting a good feel for that here. But definitely get your hands on and check it out. Some of the other features we've been talking about, achievements. Finally gonna get achievements for playing Halo. So yeah, we're very happy about that. Co-op over live, another feature we've been talking about. You know, it's funny, people tell me, man, I remember having to shove my TV in my car to go play co-op with my friends. Yeah, you don't need to do that anymore. Uh, terminals is some other stuff we've been talking about. We're gonna come back to terminals because we're actually gonna show you guys an example of that later. So this is actually a great spot that Dennis is at. You're gonna find several points through the game that's like this, that just kind of looks really cool. And this is just a really fun point to say, hey, what did this look like 10 years ago? And say, yeah, you know, things, things have changed quite a bit. Uh, you know, this for me, I like to say, this is like 10 years of gaming evolution at the touch of a button, because it's not just what Halo looked like 10 years ago. As game makers and game fans, this is how our industry has evolved over 10 years. So this is just really, really a magical experience for me. So, let's see what else is coming back. Oh yeah, the Magnum's back. <laughs> so everyone remembers this crazy overpowered weapon. It's still crazy, it's still overpowered. And we will have some more Magnum announcements to make over the next couple of days as well. So as Dennis starts having some fun with the Magnum, uh, you know, one of the announcements we made last night is uh, 3D. We are gonna have 3D support for anniversary. Reason for that, people are investing in this technology. So if you've got a 3D TV, go out and play it. If you don't, you're not missing anything. The game is gonna play, like all the features we have are intended to be supportive, right? And that was really core. The reason for the game was it needs to play the same as it did 10 years ago. So all of these features we have support it, but does not change that core gameplay in any way. So I talked a little bit about terminals. Um, you know, you guys may remember these things made their debut in Halo 3. Uh, it was a nice little Easter egg for people to find out some more uh, about you know, the universe, what was going on in the story. Primarily text on a screen. The idea was really cool, but we, you know, we thought, hey, how can we make this a little different, a little more interesting? So we've taken a more graphical approach with terminals because as storytellers, that allows us to really tell a more emotionally engaging story. So if we can switch to video one, uh, we are actually going to take a look at the first terminal in Halo Anniversary. That should be coming any moment now. Dennis, man, it's on you. You gotta carry this while we, while we do this. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, while we're waiting for the switch, at, at E3, we kind of showed a trailer to kind of show the style we were thinking of. But what we're gonna show you now, as we load video one, is actually the first terminal you're gonna see in the game. If we could get the lights down, too. By order of the Human Council, proximity to Installation 04 is forbidden. Your continued presence will result in most unpleasant countermeasures. I must insist that you immediately change course and return to a minimum safe distance of one light year. This has served as your one and final warning. I have activated defensive systems, and you now have 30 seconds to return to the minimum safe distance of... Wait. Curious. Curious indeed, after all these years. Greetings, humans, and welcome to Installation 04. Ignore prior warnings, and please continue. 
I have disabled defensive systems to allow your approach. But you must not exit your shoe once you have arrived at the designated landing center. This ring contains significant dangers, and even with your assumed legacy, I must verify the presence and pitch of your gayage before allowing full access. We have much to discuss, humans. I have been away far too long. You have been away far too long. So judging by that, uh, I'd say that went over pretty well. <laughs> uh, I do have a quick announcement that I was supposed to make earlier, but uh, it's a little late probably for most of that. But we do request uh, that uh, if it's possible that we don't allow any filming of the panel. <laughs> like I said, uh, that was a little late, so I did my due diligence and announced it. Apologize to everyone else for not saying that earlier. Um, so. Uh, you know, the, the term will be just checked out there. Real quick, before we kick it off, I forgot to introduce everyone else on the panel. So uh, my name is David Ellis. I'm content producer at 343. And uh, joining me today has already announced uh, Dennis Reese, producer on Halo Anniversary, and Dan Ayub, executive producer on Halo Anniversary. And these other two fine gentlemen in the middle is uh, Frank O'Connor, franchise director at 343 Industries. Uh, and next to him is uh, Mr. Kevin Grace. He's our franchise manager also at 343 Industries. And so since we just checked out the terminal video, I'm actually going to ask Kevin a quick question. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what we just saw and uh, why we're doing terminals again in Halo Anniversary? Hello. Oh, Lord. OK, yes. Uh, so yeah, so the terminals uh, have been a neat addition to the Halo game since the start, uh, their, their first kickoff in Halo 3, where, as Dan said, they uh, were kind of hidden in some sneaky corners, and they uh, told a text-based story about the didact and the librarian. Uh, but the reaction of the terminals was actually much, much bigger than their actual footprint in the game. It was something that people really liked to get more information about the rest of the universe, kind of exactly what events set up uh, the gameplay that you're having right there. And uh, it was something that was continued through in uh, ODST and also in Reach, through Sadie's story and through the data pads in Reach. Uh, so it seemed like a natural fit for anniversary as we were going back to uh, uh, put a little extra fun into the game for the, for the 10th uh, anniversary of Halo. And uh, also a nice way to be able to add to the story uh, of Combat Evolved without uh, changing it. So these won't change what happens in Combat Evolved. Uh, it's the same story that you played, the same story you loved 10 years ago. Uh, but it adds things to the story, around the story, and to the universe. Uh, and hopefully in such a way that if this is the first time you've played the game, if you're just meeting Master Chief now, these will help explain a little bit about uh, the Halo ring, where it came from, maybe what it was uh, designed to do. Uh, it'll tell you a little bit about this blue light bulb dude who's following you around, Guilty Spark. Uh, and, and so for the new player, it kind of helps explain a little bit about what the universe is and, and uh, lets you appreciate things a little bit more. And then for the, uh, for the hardcore fan, if you've played it a hundred times, uh, you'll also pick up some new things about some characters and some places that you thought you, uh, you had everything about before. Uh, they also feed in in some interesting ways to uh, the ex other extended universe materials that we're putting out right now, the Greg Bear books, uh, the Forerunner saga that he's telling. There's some nods to that in there. Uh, and if you're paying extra close attention, there might be a hint or two about some things that might come in the future of Halo. So um, yeah, so it was a great way to uh, kind of stick with the tradition for Halo and, and something the fans have loved uh, and add to the game and uh, just be one more thing that's in the box uh, to give us all a chance to celebrate uh, Master Chief's, not really 10th birthday, but kind of 10th birthday. And speaking for myself, uh, you know, this first uh, terminal video is just a taste. Uh, the other episodes that I've had a chance to see so far, I think they're really going to blow you away. They're pretty awesome. Well, I think we're going to... Um, Maybe at the Universe panel, uh, we'll be back here at 4 o'clock today, uh, we, we might give another little taste of those. So Just a little taste. Yeah, if you want. <clears throat> so kind of bringing it back to the campaign uh, from the terminals a little bit, uh, I had a question for uh, Dan uh, the, about the specific the entire project of Halo Anniversary. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how it came about and what were some of the struggles of getting it off the ground? <laughs> Wow, you're just throwing me out right away. Okay, um, so I mean, this is a project. It, it's funny. We get the question a lot. When did the game 
development start? When did we start thinking about it? And it's really a hard question to answer because this is something we've just been, we've been talking about for a really long time and it just accelerated as the 10th anniversary grew closer. So, you know, eventually we got to the point where, you know, this is something the community had been asking for for a really long time and we were at the 10 year anniversary of the birth of this franchise. So it really just became clear we needed to do something very special. I mean, in terms of the struggles, um, obviously there were the technical challenges involved with like lacing two engines together. I mean, that was, that was quite interesting from a technical standpoint to pull off. Um, but we're happy that we were able to do it because what was really most important for us was to make sure we maintain that gameplay. And you know, the other thing we got to was we wanted to release that original experience that existed 10 years ago, warts and all, right? I mean, we got to the point where like we weren't even going to correct the bugs because we wanted to make sure the gameplay was exactly the same as people remembered it being 10 years ago. So I mean, that was definitely a big challenge. I mean, the other big challenge came from the fact that we did want to make sure that this wasn't just an HD remake. We wanted to come up with features that were compelling, that were going to make it fun, and then helped accelerate that emotional experience we were trying to drive from people of what was it like to play this game 10 years ago. I mean, and finally it occurred to us while we were making this game, that there's really multiple audiences. There's like, you know, if you're an older guy like me, you actually remember the time you played this for the first time 10 years ago. And I mean, on a personal level, I was a PC shooter player and this game like just really changed it for me and just really made it clear that you could have a really cool shooter experience on console. But as we were developing it, <clears throat> excuse me, it hit us like, if you're an 18 year old gamer, you were eight when this game came out. And after feeling really old for a while, we're like, well, we, you know, how do we, how do we make this compel, yeah, yeah, you're way younger than me, Kevin. <laughs> we're like, well, how do we make this compelling for that player as well? And, you know, that's, that's where the new graphics kind of come in because, you know, a lot of people jumped in at Halo 2, Halo 3, things like that, and just may have looked at these original graphics as a barrier to get into the game. And that's kind of where the new graphics kind of made it really cool because, you know, you don't have that barrier to get into the game anymore and you can experience that really special gameplay for the first time. So, I mean, it was definitely a challenge experience. I think it was definitely a labor of love for us as well. I mean, everything about this was we wanted to make this special and we wanted to make this celebration uh, right down to the price point, right? I mean, we've got it to out a $39 price point because we just really wanted to make this a big celebration um, and yeah, I mean, I don't know, Dennis, were you, anything you want to add to that? Uh, I mean, personally, right when I first started on the project uh, and people uh -huh. started to find out I'd be the producer, I suddenly got this influx of mails from all across the studio of, you know, hey, do not change the game. Do not change the game. And for me, that was, a, I mean, I never planned on it, but just dealing with all of the people coming by my desk saying, Oh, you know, please, I got, I got some great suggestions of other things you can do for achievements of Easter eggs and just all of the input and trying to sift through it and make sure that people understood that we we're going to keep the, everything the same and make sure that we paid as much respect to the game as possible while still trying to make it fun and just sort of, you know, figuring out everyone to work with. That was a bit of a struggle at first, but yeah, it was yeah, fun. Yeah, I think Ellis sent a picture of Dennis's kids to him with a note that said, don't screw this up, so. Yeah. <laughs> for the record, uh, for the record, I make no apologies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, David Ellis, yes. So uh, one of the things we talked a little bit about, uh, Dan, uh, during the demo is that you were offering stereoscopic 3D support uh, for Halo Anniversary. Uh, obviously we couldn't show it in 3D today on these projectors in this panel, but uh, people will have an uh, opportunity to experience uh, Halo Anniversary in 3D for themselves. Can you talk a little bit about how they will be able to check that out and where? Yeah, so I mean, a quick word about the 3D. Um, you know, we showed that we, to some people behind closed doors at Gamescom. And I mean, just a word about that is when we decided we were going to do it, because again, this is technology that people have invested in. And if you've got a 3D TV, you're like, God damn, I want some content for this thing. Um, but what, does that count as swearing? Sorry, Ellis. I blew it. That did not take long. That was a losing battle. All right. All right. So we, we decided if we were going to do it, we wanted to do, you know, we wanted to do something properly. And what a lot of people at Gamescom commented on is like, well, you know, we've seen some other games running in 3D. Yours looks better. Why is that? And the reason is we didn't grab an off-the-shelf 3D solution like a lot of people do. We actually developed something ourselves that allowed us to tweak it. And the user can actually tweak the 3D settings themselves. So it actually pops a lot more than regular 3D. And uh, if you head over to the Halo Fest uh, corner, or nook, or area, or section, or whatever we're calling it, where actually we've got a 3D center where you're actually going to get a, ch a chance to check it out. And actually on G Guilty Spark is actually a really good level for that because you get some great, you know, the, the foliage pops and the, you know, plasma's flying by your head. It's actually a great place to check it out. So we've showed a little bit of the campaign. Uh, the other aspect we talked a little bit about during the uh, demo was multiplayer support 
for Halo Anniversary. Uh, so far, we've shown a couple of maps and announced uh, that each map will come with two unique variants when the game ships. Uh, one will replicate the uh, feel and flow of the original version, so Beaver Creek is going to look and play like Beaver Creek. Uh, but we've also included a new, new variant for each one that will have new spaces that weren't in the original map. And we're including that to kind of take advantage of the entire Reach sandbox if you're playing just vanilla Reach. But if you want to play classic, you can play the classic version as well. So every single one of the multiplayer maps will ship with two different variants. And uh, you know, today we're going to show off some of the maps. Uh, some of them are playable, as Dan mentioned, at Halo Fest. Uh, but before we kind of kick this section off, we're going to show a uh, quick behind the scenes video that's going to show off some of the maps and uh, maybe some familiar spaces or two. So if we can just roll video two. There's always been an aspect of Halo 1 multiplayer that was really, really strong, which was Halo 1 had this incredibly diverse set of maps. It really was this incredibly focused experience. It had this beautiful simplicity. It's not often that a game just addicts me like that, where I just have to keep playing it. It was amazing to me just to see how our entire art team would just go down for entire evenings at a time, right? Just from 4 o'clock till 10 o'clock to just play Halo multiplayer. It wasn't that easy to just go through and say, oh, well, these are the maps that shipped with the original ones and this is what we're going to do because we want to do something bigger around the 10th anniversary. We also had to think about the existing Reach player base and we didn't want to fragment it. We were looking at it from the player's perspective in the current day with the current abilities and saying, how would I play this level and what do I think is missing? So we looked at maps from the Halo series entire, including Halo CE for PC and even Halo 2, and we thought, which of the maps are people's favorites that work well with the Reach uh, engine and work well with modern kind of gameplay? One of the things we kind of came back to was that we wanted people to take a look at the map and immediately think like, oh yeah, I loved that map. Beaver Creek was actually the first map that started the whole conversation of are we going to enhance the maps or are we going to just do pure remakes? So for each of the maps, we're doing two modes. We're doing a classic mode, which is staying as true to the classic map layout as possible. And we're doing a kind of a default tweaked and refined mode. Because you have things like Sprint and Jetpack, we took the opportunity to put in some new spaces and some new routes. There are tunnels and areas that you can keep the flow of the gameplay moving, so it's not so much of a dead end when you get to the end of the canyon. This is still a small map. It feels bigger than it is. They don't feel as isolated. You feel very much like you're in a world that's alive and in flux. We want you to feel that pang of nostalgia in your chest every time you look at the map. We chose Timberland because it was, uh, it was kind of an unsung classic. Probably one of the best vehicle maps. I spent a lot of time in custom servers on Halo PC just playing Team Slayer on it. The map itself is actually 20% smaller than what it used to be. On the art side, we've added a lot more tree cover. Now there's a big canopy of trees which kind of envelop the play space more. I'd like to think of this as Central Park, New York City. Here's this beautiful landscape, but right on the edge of a city all around them. There's so many tight turns that there are lots of places for you you get hung up on and grenaded. Just fun stuff happens. What other FPS do you get to put colorful flowers and green grass on your map? Another example of a map that was gray walls all the way through. I feel like you're just in a box with ramps. We decided to make it a prison by putting it in a place where it couldn't be accessed. We had to open up a lot of walls with windows. We even added glass to the floor. It's an interesting challenge to add navigation or even add new pathways that aren't dominated by jetpack in a purely vertical map. Added bridges and overhangs that change the flow of the map. We don't want to overdo it because if there's too much noise in a confined space, then the map gets just frustrating to navigate. The gameplay is still the same, but it makes you feel like you're in a much more dynamic world. Dan Mason is a good example of really pretty much purple walls, and that's what represented the Covenant theme. We kind of left it to certain affinity to think about, like, well, can they give this map a context? And I think they started by looking in the room with the waterfalls. We really wanted to give people a sense that they were in this water processing plant or this facility that had to deal with these natural elements. The bottom area at the base of the waterfall, there used to be spaces in between them, so you had to jump from the three spaces that sent it out. Now that's just a single walkway. You didn't realize the first time you played it in the original, but now there's all these ledges and different opportunities to get around your opponent and flank them that weren't there before. I think with our additions, so you don't accidentally fall to your death all the time, and also the jetpack, that map has really changed a lot, just the general flow, and it's a lot of fun to play. This location we chose is kind of where the genesis of Firefight began. It's a place where you stop and you defend. Traditionally, Firefight, you've never really had the Marines fighting with you, and that's something we were able to do, and we thought, well, if we can pull this off, 
this is gonna be a nice new take on Firefight. Now it's you, your friends, and some buddies, or if you're playing by yourself, now you actually have some help. Honestly, there's just nothing better than hopping online with a buddy, getting in a warthog, just killing some grunts. It's fun. Normally with a title update, what happens is you download the title update and your world has changed forever. So we couldn't really give them the existing Halo CE gameplay with an online component. This was the next best thing. A lot of the fun of Halo 1 is being able to use the Magnum again, and we wanted to allow you to use that in multiplayer. We were able to replicate the look and feel of the Halo 1 pistol with the standard pistol from Reach. Three headshots, anyone on the map, you're going to take an enemy down. We've made sure that we can implement these changes on a game type level, which means we can have a version of Slayer that is exactly as it's always been and a version of Slayer with our title update changes. We're going to be releasing beta hoppers before the launch of Halo Anniversary and we're going to utilize all the feedback we get from the millions of players that participate to help ultimately shape this title update. If people take away one thing from the Halo Anniversary DLC, it's the realization that those old classic maps still feel really modern. It's like a brand new map all over again once you get the armor abilities in there. The soul of all of these maps are still very present. And in fact, in many ways, they're enhanced now. Overall, the campaign and the multiplayer, it just hasn't aged in the way that we expected it to feel. And when I switch to classic mode and campaign, or when I play Beaver Creek and multiplayer, it feels new and it still feels nostalgic. And that's a strange mixture of feelings. So, of course, in addition to announcing a new multiplayer map, Prisoner, that we hadn't shown before, we also announced Installation 04, the firefight mission that will be included as part of Halo Anniversary in November. Uh, of course, we ended the piece off with uh, some information about the title update. Uh, obviously, the uh, big news uh, for that video is that the classic Magnum is being brought back in multiplayer. You'll be able to play that in uh, Anniversary Slayer game types. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the title update, uh, just to kind of give you a rundown of what will be included in the title update, and uh, so you'll know what to expect when that launches. Um, we're planning on launching the title update in, sometime in mid to late September. Uh, we're not quite sure on the date. There's certification issues, so I don't want to promise the date if we're not going to hit it, so, but it will be sometime in late, probably late September. Uh, in addition to that, and the way the title update works is we are able to control a lot of the uh, changes and options that we've added to Halo Reach uh, in by a playlist and hopper support. So you'll have game types that will allow you, to, for example, to play with you know the Halo One Magnum, for, for example, on maps, and you'll be able to do that on every single map in Reach. So it's controlled by game type. So it's not just uh, kept back to the original or the maps that are coming out on anniversary. Uh, we'll also be launching those first playlists that will actually support the title update in early October. So there will be a small lag between the title update downloading and the game types being released to the public. Uh, we'll also have forums available on Halo Waypoint where we're going to be checking out feedback, listening to the fans. Uh, if you check out the Halo Fest space, all the stations, you'll be able to play some examples of the title update game types this weekend. But there's also going to be a URL uh, on top of all the stations, which I believe is Halo Waypoint backslash TU. If that might be wrong, if it is, I apologize. But we'll get the proper URL out there through Twitter, Facebook, and on our, all our forums and everything. So, uh, But let me give you a quick rundown of what uh, is added as far as title update. Um, so we had a few things under the hood that we kind of changed. Uh, ultimately, what we wanted to do uh, is, for example, if you picked up you know, Halo games in the past, playing co-op in Firefight required having a hard drive in your system. So if you had a four gigabyte system, um, you unfortunately couldn't experience those modes to the fullest of their potential. So we've actually fixed that as part of the title update or added functionality. So if you have a four gigabyte Xbox 360 system, you can now experience Firefight and co-op uh, along with everyone else. In addition to that, we've modified several things in the back end, given our designers uh, extra options to tweak things to uh, ultimately help create this more classic Slayer experience as part of Analog Anniversary. But along with that, uh, we'll have some abilities to tweak some stuff in other game types in Halo Reach. Uh, so the first one off the top, some people may have noticed that uh, we put out a gameplay uh, match on Damnation a couple weeks ago. Some people may have noticed a few things that were there or maybe not there. Uh, so right off the bat, uh, one of the things, the abilities we have now is to turn on uh, Damage Bleed. Uh, through classic kind of Halo 3 style, Halo earlier Halo tiles. So for example, in Halo Reach by itself, uh, your shields and uh, health system are wholly separate. So the damage that you do on the shields don't carry over to the health underneath. That's now changed. We have the ability to turn that on in a playlist so that it, if you take someone down really close to their shields popping, any damage you do to them will carry over to the underlying health. 
Um, we also have the ability to configure reticle bloom uh, and adjust that, and we have a wide variety of options. Uh, we can turn it off. We can put out a mode where there's no reticle bloom at all. <laughs> and that's what we did in the damnation gameplay. But we also have the ability to tweak it in any variable from zero to 100%. 100% being regular reach bloom and being able to tweak it accordingly. So we have a lot of options and we'll be taking that feedback in from the community when the beta hoppers launch in early October. Uh, in addition, we've uh, modified armor lock. We have the ability to modify armor lock a little bit. Uh, if you get a uh, sticky grenade on you uh, in, in reach right now, if you get stuck, you can armor lock and it'll pop sticky grenade out and survive. That's no longer the case. So right now, if, uh, if, if we turn on the modified armor lock and you get stuck and you armor lock, you're still going to die. Yeah. Uh, another difference is also uh, we also have the ability to turn on, uh, as part of the modified armor lock, it, while you're armor locked, you are basically invincible as long as your bar is filled up. But any damage you take, whether it's a grenade or gunfire, anything like that, will actually cause the armor ability energy to run down faster. So for example, if a grenade gets thrown at your feet while you're armor locked, it'll cause you to lose a huge, pretty good, decent chunk of your uh, energy. And once that's out, you're popped out of armor lock. So you're no longer invulnerable. Yeah. And uh, as part of that, we also have the ability to tweak how, how much damage uh, affects that energy. So we'll be able to tweak those in different playlists as part of the beta. Uh, we also have the ability to modify active camo. So first off, this we have the ability to reduce the bonus time the player gets in active camo while standing still. So Hopefully, if you're playing on Highlands and someone's uh, camo sniping from across the map, they won't necessarily be able to hang out as long as they could in the past. Uh, and uh, in general, we've reduced the overall length of time the player can be in active camo. Another thing which we uh, added in as part of the cl more classic experience is we have the ability to remove sword block on anything but the sword. So you can't block sword with like a gun or melee or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> Um, and one of the things I just want to point out is that every single one of these things in the title update is controlled by playlist. So uh, we, you won't have the ability at home to kind of tweak them in the UI yourself, but we'll have the ability to spit out game types uh, to, you know, react to community feedback on all these features. And that's one of the reasons we're going to be running the beta hopper before Halo Anniversary launches. So that's pretty much it for the title update. I kind of want to go back into multiplayer in general. Um, Dan, uh, you know, we decided to use Reach as the multiplayer base for Halo Anniversary. Can you talk a little bit about why we chose this path? Yeah, there were, there were a couple of reasons we wanted to use the Reach engine for that. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of goodness that comes with that. So, I mean, what's great about it is things like Safe Film, Forge, all of that great stuff that comes with it we're still going to be able to use. Um, and then there's the fun that comes with armor abilities that, you know, you saw in the video, and I say all the time, the first time I played Beaver Creek and guys are flying over me in jetpacks dropping grenades on me, uh, Dennis, Usually, uh, you know, it changes that experience quite a bit and it makes it a lot of fun. But I mean, obviously we know there's people that want that, you know, whole classic experience and those people absolutely have the ability to do that with the classic variants. But the Reach Engine did offer, you know, that kind of uh, thing to make it interesting. I mean, and then the second reason was just population, right? I mean, the notion being that if, you know, if Kevin's playing Reach and I've got Anniversary, we wanted to be able to play together and, you know, we didn't want to penalize Reach players, of course, by any means by doing something completely different. Uh, so those were really the two primary driving reasons of why we decided to use that, uh, the Reach Engine. And kind of following up on that, going back to the title update, Frank, uh, you know, the title update is a big part, of, like I said, to helping to replicate the classic experience. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what the high level goals were for the update and ultimately what we're trying to accomplish? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the, the, the number one thing is this is additive. I mean, you've, you've already mentioned this. This is just giving uh, people who, who want to play Reach differently as it ages. And uh, obviously, more importantly, people who want to play Anniversary in, in a, as close to a CE style as we can possibly replicate, uh, the title update lets us do that, and that was, the, that was really job one. The other cool stuff that the engineering team, who worked very hard, and a special shout out to Greg Herman, uh, one of our engineers, for, for making it happen so quickly. We also got to fix some little bugs, and there's some stuff we won't even bother listing because it's mostly invisible. But uh, it, was just, it was just a really great process to sit down and talk about what we could do that wouldn't wreck the game and uh, what we could do that could really make a classic experience. One thing I wanted to, to point out was David had mentioned that this is all done at matchmaking level. Uh, you, you can save those game types and put them in your customs as well. So you do, well, you don't have the ability to control it, you do have the ability to collate and collect game types and uh, 
features that you particularly enjoy. So if you encounter in matchmaking something with the bloom all the way off, uh, you can just save that game type and that's automatically a part of your, uh, your custom game. So it will spread around really quickly to the point where we expect just about everything will eventually be available as customs too. So I don't want to downplay customs. But uh, as, as you mentioned at the start, this is a great way to... You know, when we, we first looked at doing the CE multiplayer engine and trying to apply a networking layer to that and peer-to-peer, -peer, and it would have been a really different game. It would not have been the game that you remember exactly. And even if any of you guys have ever played XB Connect or XB Kai tunneling software, it changes the way the game plays, and it's, it's not optimum. Uh, we, with the time we had and the schedule we had and the resources that we had, it would have been a huge risk to do that and completely impractical. And we would have showed up in the middle of 2011 with a game that interrupted the ecosystem and flow uh, for Halo Reach. So this was the best of both worlds. And it is a compromise, but I think great things sometimes come out of compromise. And we think people are really going to like the results. And uh, I think Frank pretty much covered everything. One of the things I do want to add, we are going to be working with other community partners, uh, for example, MLG, to, uh, so that we can work with them to uh, you know, alter any game types they want to, to take advantage of all the features uh, that we're offering as part of this title update. Yeah. Um, that's, that's one end of the spectrum. And on the other end is uh, we'll work with people from all across the community so that HBO can have all plasma pistol, 200% uh, <laughs> shield, invisible darkness, <laughs> nightmare maps. <laughs> And uh, one other thing I wanted to hit on, we're going to take some questions here in a little bit, but uh, the Firefight Mission Installation 04, uh, Frank had been dropping some hints recently on some uh, message boards about some little extra things we're adding. I don't know if you picked it up in the video, but uh, you're actually going to have AI-controlled ODSTs fighting alongside you in Firefight. So if, uh, if, you, if you're like Dennis, you don't have a lot of friends to play with at home, yeah. um, we created some friends for you in Firefight, so you can always have a battle bro on your back. So I think that's, uh, I think we're almost running out of time. We have about 10 minutes left. So we're going to be taking some questions. I believe there are microphones set up somewhere. Oh, yeah. So we have a microphone here on the right and left. So if you can just uh, file up real quick. And I believe we're going to have some goodie bags we're going to hand out to folks asking questions. So I think if I can get some help handing those out, that'd be great. All right. So we're going to start over here on the right and then alternate right, left, right, left. So. I think you're uh, sorry it's a little quiet. I think you're asking if uh, saved films and uh, other normal reach multiplayer features are going to be there. Yeah, for all the anniversary multiplayer maps. Uh, no saved films uh, for uh, campaign, but all the multiplayer maps, everything should operate exactly as you expect. Yeah. So here on the left. Yeah. So, I mean, we, you know, I, I would encourage everyone to come to the Halo 4 panel on, on Sunday morning, uh, and we'll talk more about Halo 4. I doubt we'll get that specific, but, uh, but it, is, uh, it is an interesting point. But I think, uh, back to the terminals thing, um, it's going to definitely explain some aspects of deep canon that fiction fans are interested in, but it's not designed to be sort of canon spackle, as we say, why was it the Pillar of Autumn uh, near the surface at this window of time? It's a, it's a really deep story, and most of its connections are actually uh, uh, to Cryptum, the Greg Bear novel, and the series. Uh, there's, there's some stuff in there that we're seeding, and, uh, and also little bits of Halo 4, but mostly Guilty Spark story. That's what the story is. Uh, Kevin actually wrote the script for this, and it's beautiful, and it's uh, it's actually really sad. Uh, you know, this is a this is a creature who's been alone and in charge of a 
deadly super weapon for 100,000 years and, and he's completely alone and you get to find out a little bit more about him. So we're going to go over to the right. If we can just keep it to one question, that way we get <laughs> as much as we can with everyone. Get in. Not, not an anniversary. <laughs> hey, uh, Dan, I think you can take this question. Dan. That is a wonderful question. Uh, one I'm getting a lot these days. So, I mean, obviously, everything we're doing right now is around the 10-year anniversary of the first one. But, you know, I like to say we're doing the first one because it's what people are asking for. So, you know, anything's possible, right? <laughs> send, send Dan emails, his email address. Is ah, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, unfortunately, no is the, the clear answer, but a simpler answer is uh, local, local system link play is available on the Gandhi version, the games on the man version of Halo, which also runs at 720p. And that was another one of the weird factors we had to consider when we were making this, is that game actually already exists and runs on the 360 and is available right now. I think it's only 1999, right? Yeah, yeah and it, it, that's not a great answer, and it's probably not a good enough answer, but it's a, it's a fact. The game is out there, and if you want to play System Link, you can, you can get on Games on Demand and, uh, and play it that way. I, I hate that answer, but it's the truth. Wait, Dennis, wait, I'm, wait. Not, I'm gonna jump in beforehand. Oh, right. So we are gonna be talking more about skulls this weekend. If you come to the Halo anniversary campaign oh, panel oh, so tomorrow, it's so close. I, I gotta, I gotta keep uh, something for the rest of the weekend. Otherwise, uh, <laughs> you guys get restless and I get beat up, and I don't want that. Dennis is a cheap drunk, so there's a quick way to that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mr. Yamamoto. Uh, question about the armor lock and the grenade. Can you sacrifice yourself if you get stuck? Armor lock and contain the explosion? You mean to keep other people around exactly. you? Exactly. If you've got teammates around you, keeping them from getting flacked? Uh, I'll have to check on that, but uh, I'll make sure we answer that on the Sunday question. afternoon multiplayer panel. Yeah. Thanks, gentlemen. I, I don't know 100%, so I don't want to answer it and possibly be wrong. All right. Um, so you guys already said you guys can play um, from Anniversary to Reach. Uh, for the, all of us who play Reach like throughout this whole year, are we going to have to start all over from level one, or are we going to get all of our armor to begin with that we've been unlocking, getting to commander with, and our helmets and whatnot? Uh, I mean, I, th I think if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, wh when you play Anniversary, will it reset your Reach multiplayer experience? Yeah. No, it, it's, it should be fairly seamless. I mean, fingers crossed, right? But uh, what should happen, uh, and we'll get into detail on this in a little while, is you'll be able to basically install the maps to your hard drive and play them from Reach, uh, but also you can, you can launch them from the disk. But it will be your Reach career, it'll be linked to your gamer tag, and everything should be the same. So, all right, thank you. Okay, now regarding the ODSTs from the um, Firefight map, are they just going to spawn every round, or is there going to be a set amount that spawn at the beginning? Um, you guys go, go play it and find out. It's across the street. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if the you said that when you're playing you can have reach and you can play with someone who has the anniversary disc online multiplayer together uh, when you do that uh, are you going to be able to play the reach maps from your com from your anniversary uh, you, if you already have reach and you have it installed to your hard drive yes and if you don't have reach you're, you're limited to the maps that ship with anniversary so six multiplayer and one firefight. And everything, I should, should refresh this, everything in Anniversary launches from one menu and one disc, so that's a completely seamless experience. If you already have Reach, you can uh, basically uh, embroider those maps into your Reach uh, menu and, and play them as normal DLC. Okay, thanks. 
Hey, uh, Marty O'Donnell's already got the music well covered for, for the original game, but I was wondering if there's any new music that we could expect in any kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, sort of. So, Marty wrote a, a beautiful, amazing score for Halo, and uh, he's going to be... Is he in this room later today? Four yes. O'clock. Four o'clock this room, Marty's going to be here himself, and so... One of the, the great joys, apart from the gameplay and the features that Bungie put in the game, one of the only things that we didn't have to worry about is if we had good music because we were able to take Marty's original scores and re-record them with a, a much, much more expensive orchestra. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, it, it was one of the, you know, like the gameplay, we, we kind of didn't have to worry about that. But there, uh, there will be some new things in the soundtrack, for sure, when we put out a soundtrack uh, for Halo Anniversary with the re-recordings. There are a couple of new pieces in one of them uh, <laughs> yesterday. I, I can only describe it as butt rock. And, uh, and it was like 40 seconds long, and, I, and, and I'm, I'm in, I was in charge of naming the tracks yesterday, so I'm coming up with tracks that sort of respect the original names. And this one was called DD1 or something, and so I talked to Christopher Malroth, our audio director, who sent me the soundtrack. I'm like, what is, what is DD1? It's, it's butt rock, and it's 60 seconds long, and worse, it sounds like it was recorded through a tin can. And he's like... Oh, that's the piece of music that Sergeant Johnson is listening to, and Jenkins is like, "You like the old stuff," <laughs> but that's apparently going to be on the soundtrack. So when you get to a really weird track, those are all muffled and crazy. <laughs> Thanks, Frankie. So uh, I think we got time for one more question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Sorry, everyone else in line, but we have we have other panels the rest of the weekend, so come and get in line and early for those. Talk Maybe to get your questions. We're be on the show floor. Yeah, and uh, after the panel's over. We're going to be going out to the lobby, so we're going to be hanging out for a little bit and chatting with you guys, so maybe we can get your questions answered at that point. I just had a quick question about uh, the save films for CEA. Um, in Halo Reach, you could do the same thing as Halo 3. You could go into multiplayer, save clips of your favorite uh, gameplay. Is there going to be the same thing in Halo CEA where you could have more than one person in the same lobby watching the same film, like Halo 3? Yes. Or is it just one person like Reach is? So the question is, uh, in theater mode, in Halo 3, you could have more than one person in the lobby online. Uh, and in Halo Reach, that, uh, you have one person. There are some networking issues associated with that. Um, since we are using the Reach, uh, it'll be consistent with what it is in Halo Reach. Who can say what the future holds? <laughs> So I think that's all the questions for us. I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, this first panel here at Halo Fest. Uh, and just as a quick reminder, just as a quick reminder, we're going to be outside in the lobby hanging out for a little bit, chatting. Uh, when you get a chance, make sure you make your way over to the 8th Street Annex. It's right across the street from the Convention Center. We're on the third floor. We have uh, dozens and dozens of stations uh, set up so you can play some Halo Anniversary. We're going to have panels and lots of other awesome stuff. So I encourage everyone to come by and check it out. Thank you. <laughs>